Uh, thank you, everyone. It's great to be in Atlanta. I love this city. Um, and I'm just honored to be here again. And I hope that I can tie up uh, this session by following the great work that the other um, speakers have presented to you. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about um, some findings from the LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans um, in collaboration with the Pennington Biomedical Research Center in Baton Rouge, so both LSU campuses. I want to acknowledge the Jim Fink's Endowed Fund, um, which does help with a lot of this um, research. And um, similar to what um, you saw earlier, I'm going to try to make this work, let's see. Maybe not, okay. Um, the other speakers have covered sort of the prenatal, postnatal infancy um, part of the puzzle that creates childhood obesity. If you look to the far right, um, I'm gonna concentrate on early childhood, and in particular, children prior to puberty. And it's a very complicated genetic, environmental, interactive sequence, um, and inflammation seems to be the least understood, um, and this is what some of our more recent studies have concentrated on. I, I have some background information here, and I have references um, if you guys want to jot them down, but I'm going to try to just give you the, the lay version of this. And basically, in adults, we have really good information uh, suggesting that obesity is an inflammatory disease, and that because of uh, fat that's deposited in the truncal area, and you'll hear this word VAT throughout my uh, discussion today, it's visceral adipose tissue. Because of that, and because it excretes um, inflammatory cells, um, cytokines in particular, it's, it's, uh, it's actually into the bloodstream. Um, and over time, that action contributes to fat around the organs and in the skeletal muscles, and we now know that as ectopic fat, and it's the amount of fat inside the cell versus outside the cell, and the amount of fat inside the cell is quite frankly dangerous. It interferes with normal metabolism. Um, we, it's very well documented in adults, as I said earlier, in adolescents. Um, we have a couple of studies, but prior to our work, which I'm going to present today, we did not have any studies in prepubertal children. Um, we believe that the metabolic ab abnormalities that, that drive obesity, obesity to heart disease and diabetes in more particular probably begin in the womb, um, probably at conception, and quite frankly go through um, into the adolescent years. Um, but we really need more studies in developing children, and that is children from very young age through the pubertal period. So just a simple review that children are not adults. I do a lot of research in exercise physiology. I'm a clinical exercise physiologist. Um, and over the years, in my team, my research team has documented lots of um, studies and our own studies that show that children are just quite frankly different. And when we try to impose adult nutrition and physical activity on them, it just doesn't work. I'm going to concentrate more on that last bullet, which is the immature metabolism of children and why that may not equal what we're finding in adults, especially with regard to inflammation and to a lesser degree with some preliminary studies on social disadvantage. So I was funded by um, several of the National Institutes of Health um, divisions to do this study um, over, it was about six or seven years because it ran into Hurricane Katrina, if y'all kind of remember that little thing. Um, but our goal was to recruit um, a cohort of diverse children, um, uh, half African American and half Caucasian. And we were especially interested in those with either low or high birth weight. And I think you've heard a lot about the high birth weight today already, but the low birth weight, especially in disadvantaged um, families, is a real concern as well because it does also promote metabolic dysfunction in the offspring. That long list of measures on the, in the orange that you see, which I'm not going to go through right now, are the tests that the children participated in. And they were seven to nine years of age. And this is what they got after participating. They got a certificate telling them that they were astronauts. And that's because, quite frankly, they were, because they were in test for two and a half days. 
uh, one at the Children's Hospital in New Orleans, and then a full day at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center in Baton Rouge. And this is one of my participants who actually said I could use her picture, and that's the silly astronaut um, certificate that she brought to school once she completed it. More recently, we've done some preliminary analysis, and this is actually not even published yet, um, on social determinants using an index called Concentrated Disadvantage Index. And with census data from the American Community Survey, we looked at the study participants' residence, so the child's residence, and then we determined the percent of individuals in a concentric area. I believe it was one mile. It may have been two mile. I'm not quite sure um, where these children either fell below the poverty line received public assistance, um, these were the risk factors, female-headed household, unemployed, young, less than 18 years of age, and being black um, was a risk factor, which made the analysis interesting, and I'm gonna show you the results in just a second. Another method that we did, and this is why they had to report to the Children's Hospital early in the morning for basically a half day, was we did a, a frequently sampled intravenous glucose tolerance test. Again, in these prepubertal children, they were less than Tanner stage two. Um, actually, we excluded any that were over um, Tanner two, and about 26% were at seven and nine years of age. They were already in puberty, primarily the girls. But these children uh, were in a bed with a TV with a cartoon playing, and um, we infused glucose at zero minutes and then insulin at 20 minutes, and then tracked their response to the insulin challenge um, over uh, 14 different samples and basically three hours. And the data we got was quite impressive. I'll tell you we had uh, more screen failures than we wanted, primarily due to it's very difficult in the lean children trying to get a, um, the IV in. And some of the children actually went into hyperglycemia because they were so lean and we had to modify our, our procedures over time. But we did end up with a, a, an adequate sample to say something about this very um, precise test of insulin sensitivity. When they went to the Pennington Research Center in Baton Rouge, um, they went into what we call the magnet. It's an MRI machine, and they participated in mass spectroscopy. So um, at first they went in full body, and we examined their liver, and there's an example of the, the liver results there um, compared to a water phantom. So it's a um, container full of water, and so the amount of lipid inside their liver cell versus outside their liver cell using this technique gave us a value, and you can see the little blip in the frequency is the actual uh, intrahepatic lipid, uh, ectopic fat. Um, we then did it in their soleus muscle, so they came out of the unit and then just their leg went in, and we did it in the soleus muscle as well, and that gave us a measure, which I don't have a diagram of, of intramyocellular lipids, which is fat inside the skeletal muscle cell versus outside, and remember, inside the cell is not good. Um, oops, wrong way. Uh, um, the next thing we did, um, I work with a, a brilliant scientist named Giovanni Zabaleta, and he's actually at the, the Cancer Center in New Orleans, which is an LSU uh, and Tulane Center. And we looked at the inflammatory markers of these children. Um, and this is based on the background that I, I talked about before, that when these children have excess fat in their stomach, they should be excreting more inflammation. And we wanted to know um, if that inflammation was related to that liver fat that we measured. And interestingly enough, um, this was quite unexpected. In the adult literature, um, you get the exact opposite relationship. You actually get a relationship that is positive. So the more inflammation, the more fat inside the liver cell. But in children, it was just the opposite. So tumor necrosis factor um, was the inflammatory marker that we looked at, and then um, again, liver fat, and you can see that we got a significant correlation. Uh, by the way, you can see the few outliers at the top there. Um, they were basically um, taken out of the analysis to see if that made a difference, because we thought, well, maybe they came in and they, even though we, we would have excluded them if they were sick, maybe they were sick, and they basically, um, right here, once we excluded them, it didn't make a difference. So you can see the trend is, is, is opposite. Um, we're, we continue to do uh, analysis in this. I'm not presenting, but um, the uh, anti-inflammatory um, chemicals or uh, markers, uh, ghrelin and uh, resistin, were also opposite so, um, to what they would normally have been. 
I'm gonna move to um, the obese children in this cohort. And let me say again that these were healthy children. We excluded for every known disease. Um, if they were in any type of medication, they were not uh, included in, in our study. Um, even if they were on ADHD medication, and by the way, those on ADHD medication, about 46% were excluded, seven to nine year old children. Um, but we did divide the cohort by obese children versus not obese children. Uh, and it, it sort of replicated what we find in, in Louisiana, which is about 35% obese and about 65% healthy weight. Um, again, over the last two decade, decades, my research team and I have documented how different overweight children are from healthy weight children. And again, I'm not going to go through you know, these bullets for you, but they're quite extensive in the literature. I am going to talk about how metabolically compromised they are and how we were able to doc document this quite well. And, and really quite alarming. Um, this is basically a slide of insulin sensitivity. Um, it's been log transformed and total body fat. And if you remember the background I talked about at the beginning of my lecture, um, in adults it was quite clear, and even a couple of studies in adolescence, that you would have this finding, you know, this robust um, correlation significance, so that the more overweight the child was, the less the insulin sensitivity. And it's clear in this, and this is the first study we published, and this was my co-investigator, Larson Mayer, who published this, um, and later confirmed by my grad assistant, uh, Brian Bennett. But this was the part that we were not uh, expecting. We weren't expecting that when we divided them by obese and non-obese that we get so much of a difference. So that the non-obese children, insulin sensitivity was 2.43, the obese, 1.77. Um, and this had been only shown in one other study of um, young children where they control for pubertal status, but this was the first time we've, we've seen this in exclusively prepubertal children. The same was true with insulin sensitivity here, um, excuse me, ectopic fat here, and basically um, intramyocellular fat versus intrahepatic fat, intramyocellular and intrahepatic. And again, um, significant differences between the obese and non-obese, such that in liver fat, the obese children had three times the liver fat inside their liver cell. Um, we then identified this as the early marker for metabolic syndrome and ultimately type 2 diabetes in children. And um, Brian Bennett, again, published this, uh, my grad assistant, in obesity. To summarize everything, we actually had our statistician, Dr. Julia Volofofa, develop a model, um, she, and she used the best model approach um, using a te technique called with lean squares, uh, lean mean squares, and basically came up with predictive variables that uh, gave us about 62% of the variance, and it was significant, as you can see here. But in all the data we collected, um, birth weight did come out as a predictor. Um, and actually low birth weight, not high birth weight in this cohort. Because remember, this was, an was not an obese cohort. It was a mixed cohort of non-obese and obese. And we think that that's why low birth weight came out. Um, fat within the liver cell, along with some of the more common metabolic syndrome and total physical activity. Um, we do have uh, nutrition measures, but we did not consider them in this, this analysis at this time. Um, we're gonna do that in some future research. So if you remember the introduction I gave everyone at the beginning, um, we now know that even prepubertal children have a similar sequence with regard to if they get fat around the truncal area, and we did measure VAT, I didn't show you that, but we did measure VAT with an MRI, uh, visceral ad adipose tissue. Um, this is going to lead to obesity-related metabolic dysfunction. We believe because uh, fatty acid tr transport um, is, is impaired, and it moves adipose tissue toward liver and muscle tissue. Um, we think that the precursors to this, um, this ectopic fat that's IHL and IMCL that I talk about, happen before puberty, before seven, eight years of age, and that they are strong determinants of insulin sensitivity. But here's the problem. Liver fat and visceral fat are really highly correlated. Um, they are almost one. Um, the VAT secretes the pro-inflammatory uh, uh, adipokines, which lead to this oxidative damage, this cell death, this problem that um, makes the metabolism not work properly. And that's been shown extensively in adults, and, in, and uh, not, not as much, but a, uh, in a few adolescent studies. 
But conversely, we had the opposite um, results in these young children. And so definitely we need to do some more studies. This was just one. Um, we also documented that social disadvantage was negatively associated with inflammation in these children. And this was prior to puberty. Interestingly enough, when we controlled for race, and if you remember in the methods, uh, race was one of the in indices for this measure. When we controlled for race, the results were only true in white children, not black children. So the white children were somewhat protected from inflammation and social disadvantage being a link to obesity. As you've heard today, low or high pregnancy weight, um, birth weight, lack of breastfeeding, poor nutrition. Uh, you'll hear a little bit later during this session, I saw uh, something on sleep. Um, this collectively creates um, a phenotype for childhood obesity and that is very resistant to treatment. Um, and primarily the work we do is, is in clinical treatment of these overweight children. So we see this every day. Um, pregnancy, birth weight, breastfeeding, nutrition, physical activity, these can all be modified. We're just not doing a good job of it, unfortunately. I published this little piece, and um, do I have five minutes or five minutes for questions? After this, or? Okay, um, let me just go to this then. Um, this was a recent study, so we have enough time for questions. Um, where we did a physical activity intervention in preschoolers, so this is early childhood before pu puberty, and we were actually able to show that in the treatment group versus the control by accelerometry, we had a decrease in sedentary, an increase in moderate, and a decrease in vigorous that was significantly different from the control. So one solution, you're gonna hear a lot more uh, throughout the day, but I do wanna leave, leave enough time for questions. And here's my acknowledgments. Um, and I want to especially thank Dr. Charles Brown, um, who gave us the Jim Finks Endowed Fund that funded a lot of this along with NIH. Thank you very much. Right. Um, what Dr. Birch uh, said, and if y'all couldn't hear her, was that the reason why low birth weight may be an issue is because then it's followed by rapid weight gain, and that is a, a significant predictor of obesity. Um, I do think that there are some metabolic abnormalities that happen with low birth weight. That phenotype in particular um, tends to have less skeletal muscle and smaller organs. Um, Regardless of the rapid weight gain, I think they're set up for poor metabolism later in life, however. Um, we haven't um, studied exclusively low birth weight children, but there are studies that have, docu that have documented that. Questions? Uh, I noticed you, you measured uh, IMCL or lipid in the muscle fibers and uh, visceral fat. How about, uh, did you uh, take a look or were you able to consider uh, intermuscular fat? Because based on the literature now, we're, which is becoming more and more prevalent, right. and is a source of uh, other cytokines and, and two that can cause this metabolic problem. So have you considered the, the intermuscular fat as a part of this? So are you talking about subcutaneous adipose? No, no, no. Intramuscular. Mus fat between the muscles. Oh, okay. Yes. But that, and that's been, um, we, we've had studies show that that is reduced, obviously, with, with training. We didn't study that because we were trying to find a link between the, the cellular activity and the, um, the actual um, metabolic dysfunction. But I do think that that's a good point, and I think that's something we probably probably should look at. The reason I asked you about SAT, because SAT tends to be subcutaneous adipose tissue, people think that SAT is actually protective. And I didn't present this, but we actually showed that SAT was related to um, uh, inverse inflammation as well, um, which kind of kind of 
lends, its, lends to the idea that because these children are developing, you know, you really have to, to take these pictures of their, of their cell compartments and their um, hormones and uh, infl inflammatory uh, markers either before puberty or after puberty. And I do think a lot of studies have looked at this during puberty, and there's just too much going on for them for us to make um, any, any decisive um, comments on what's happening with uh, metabolism in developing children. Thank you for that comment. Thank you.